This is Intro to Logics Conditional Proofs Part 2. Let's continue. Here's another example we can do together to practice. And more importantly, um, you may be asking yourself at this point, what really is a conditional proof? Um, why is it we can get away with assuming the antecedent and deriving a consequent and then getting a conditional? Well, keep in mind that conditionals um, or the conditional symbol like we have in our conclusion here is an if statement, roughly speaking. So um, what we're really saying when we get a conditional is if we had this antecedent, then we could get this consequent. So let's do this practice problem together and then maybe um, as we go, I'll try to explain it a little better. So let's draw our scope line and write our assumptions at the top. We have if S then R and our second assumption, if P then not R. And we have our conclusion at the bottom, which is going to be P and Q, then S. Okay, so a good thing to do when you first get a problem is to ask yourself, what can I do with the assumptions I've been given? In the same way that you might go home at the end of the day, look in your refrigerator and see that you only have um, maybe peanut butter and bread and you ask yourself what can I make for dinner given my ingredients and you tell yourself well it looks like I'm gonna have to have peanut butter on bread right so we have only two options here and we can only use these two things to bring them together and bring about a dinner or a conclusion right um, well the great thing about a conditional proof is that if we have a conditional for our conclusion we can assume the antecedent and pretend that we have it. It's a hypothetical, right? So we assume that, what if I had P and Q? Um, and we'd write A for CP. So in the same way that when you go home and you realize you only have bread and peanut butter for dinner and you realize you're gonna have to have a peanut butter sandwich, you may think to yourself, man, if only I had um, jelly and a banana, I could add jelly and chopped banana to my sandwich and it would maybe be healthier or more appealing or something. So you ask yourself, or you think about, if I had this one other component, then I could make this other meal, right? Then I could do this other kind of sandwich. And so we're doing something very similar when we do conditional proofs. We assume, and we think about, what if I had this other assumption, which in this case is gonna be P and Q, and then you think about, if I had that other thing, then I could derive this other thing, which in this case is the consequent S. Okay, so given that analogy, let's try to make sense of how to do this problem. So we now have three assumptions because we've assumed for CP. We've drawn our scope line, and we're gonna write the consequent of the conditional we're trying to prove, which is S. And so uh, we have P and Q, and given our and elimination rules, we can split those up. We have P on line 4 and Q on line 5 from 3 and E. And now um, we can see if we can use P or Q. Notice that I split up both conjuncts from the conjunction in 3, and it may turn out that we don't really need P and Q, but it's never an error to do an extra step. It just maybe won't look as, um, won't be as succinct of an argument, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. As long as you use the rules properly, which in this case we did, it's okay to have an extra step or two. Okay, so using P, we can derive not R from modus ponens, lines two and four. So now I have not R, and using not R, we can derive not not S from one six modus tollens. So we have the negation of R, which is the um, the negation of this consequent, so we get the negation of the antecedent, and we can use dn on line 7 to take away those negation signs and get s, which is the consequent of the conditional we're trying to prove. So we now have, on our ninth line, the ability to discharge lines 3 through 8 in the conditional proof, and we've derived the conditional we've wanted. Now be sure to keep in mind that when doing conditional proofs, the antecedents that we're assuming are not necessarily true. So
So when we assumed P and Q on line three for conditional proof, we're just conceiving of a situation where we have P and Q as an assumption. But there's no need to believe that we in fact have P and Q or that P and Q is true. Instead, we're just conceiving of a hypothetical situation. What if I had P and Q? Then what could I derive? And that's why we get a conditional at the end. P and, if P and Q, then S. Now similarly, on line three, we could have just assumed a totally different antecedent and tried to derive a different conditional using the same assumptions we started with. So perhaps I assumed not R for A for CP. In this case, I draw a new scope line and maybe um, I'm trying to derive um, something different. Maybe I want if not R, then S. Right, so using line one, I could have derived not not s from one three modus tollens, and then I could use double negation to just get s on line five. And now I would have a whole new conditional, if not r, then s. And I didn't have to assume p and q. I had the option to assume any old antecedent I wanted and just ask what could I get assuming this antecedent and in this case we got if not R then S. Okay so there are a couple points you need to take away. First of all keep in mind that the assumption, assumptions for conditional proofs are not necessarily true and in some sense we don't even have them within our proof. We're really just asking ourselves what if I had this assumption what could I derive? And the second big thing you need to take away is that you can assume pretty much any antecedent for conditional proof and derive numerous consequence for that conditional proof. So for example, I, can, I could have assumed not R here, or I could have assumed P and Q, I could have assumed Q, I could have assumed S, T, whatever you want. The point is, is that um, you can assume whatever you want for conditional proof, but that assumption is going to be the antecedent of whatever conditional you derive or discharge from that proof. And furthermore, whatever line you end with is gonna be the consequent of that conditional proof. So that's why we typically start with a conditional we're trying to find. We assume the antecedent of the conditional and we derive the consequent of the conditional. But there are endless things you could assume and there are usually many, um, many different consequences you could derive given that one antecedent. So I could have stopped at line four and derived if not R, then not not S. And similarly, I could have stopped at not R over here on line six and derived if P and Q, then not R, and so forth. So there are lots of options. I know a lot has been said here. Hopefully it's not too confusing. Um, and if you are confused, just Rewatch the video, read the text, do some practice problems, whatever you have to do. Just keep working on it and hopefully it'll be really intuitive before you know it. And this concludes part two of conditional proofs. Be sure to keep practicing and we'll see you next time.